So today we'll have Vincent van der Van? Van der Okay, and he'll be talking about visualizing data through pandas. Yeah, take it away. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, first things first. Uh, we will need a bit of software um, to get all of this working. Make sure at least that you have IPython notebook. You can easily get it. Uh, probably the kind of Anaconda distribution is the easiest to get. Um, if you don't have it already, go to this website. Uh, I will have an opinionated talk about how you want to visualize things, and my personal opinion is that the best plotting library out there at this moment uh, is from the R uh, programming language. In this talk, I will also show you how easy it is to port a data frame from Pandas to R so you can still have the best of both worlds. If you want to do the plotting exercises as well, please go to the R Studio website and get that downloaded. Uh, during this talk, we will also use a couple of CSV files. Uh, you can find those on my blog, uh, http slash slash coning.com. Now, uh, having said this, my name is Vincent. I'm a data scientist at GoData Driven. I have a Dutch and United States background, is where I used to live. Before joining this company, I was an independent contractor of programming, and I was a former lecturer of calculus and statistics at a couple of universities in Holland. Uh, my current stack uh, includes a lot of Hadoop. Um, data is getting bigger and bigger, so we need to put it on clusters. I do a lot of things for the front end, because clients like to see data. Um, still, the main things I do are either done in R or in Python. Um, where I should say Python is really, really taking over the ecosystem. Uh, there used to be a time when R was the main thing you'd go to. Uh, more and more, Python has really been taking over everything. Um, again, make sure you're downloading these things. Uh, my talk will mainly focus on learning the basics of Pandas. Uh, Pandas is a very nice uh, domain-specific language to deal with data frames and data in general. Um, I will also try to convey the basics of visualization done through digiplot, and I will also talk about how you can combine the two. Uh, part of this talk will be slightly theoretical, for that I will use the slides. Uh, the other part of the talk will be done via an IPython notebook. I will try to do it as slow as I can so you can type along. Don't worry, everything that we will see today will be available after the talk on my blog. So, analyzing data. Um, I do a lot of work for a lot of clients. So, I've been at two banks, I've been at the Dutch airport, I've done two airline companies, and I've seen to online retailers. And basically, the things you really notice is that data is the main specific thing. Um, whenever we're doing stuff with data, I like to be able to see what my colleagues are doing and so I can compare uh, data. Uh, I really like things that are quick and flexible. I don't like waiting an hour for a query. I don't like it when a program needs to start off because there's a huge CSV file in it. Um, I notice that there are a lot of similar steps when I'm doing things with data. So usually, I want to see the mean or the average per geographic group, uh, per gender, per time of day. These are all sort of things I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I need those things to be quick, but I do notice that I'm doing the exact same thing constantly. Um, which brings me to the point, I really like to do the don't repeat yourself principle a lot. Um, also, I really prefer typing to mouse clicking. In general, the main conclusion is that we really shouldn't be using Excel anymore. And most companies actually still do use Excel. It's kind of ridiculous. If you go to the insurance companies of Holland, and these are people who are talking billions and billions of dollars, they still tend to use Excel. One Excel sheet gets passed to another guy, someone changes the formula in one cell, it messes the whole thing up. It's just not a pretty thing. So we need some different tools. And Python is a great programming language, so let's try to do something with Python. Um, do you guys know Big Data Borat? It's a, it's a guy on Twitter, he actually writes pretty funny but good stuff about big data. Um, technically, in data science, 80% of the time uh, we are preparing data, and 20% of the time we are spending uh, to complain about the need to prepare the data. Most of the time we actually end up doing is to prepare data, so my talk will focus in on this. Uh, because when you have the right tools, um, instead of feeling this, it'll feel a bit more like this. To put it quite bluntly. So. Uh, we're not going to do Excel analysis, we're going to be a bit more of a programming analyst. So why would you want to do Python? Besides the fact that we can do great stuff with data nowadays, uh, Python is a very flexible language. You can do networking with it, you can build websites with it, you can do scaling with it, anything. So having a language that can do all of these things basically means you have to learn less, which is a good thing. The community is very large. Um, nowadays there are a lot of libraries like NumPy that we can use, so performance is not necessarily a burden. And the main thing that people tend to like about Python is um, it tends to be written quickly. So 
I can write a couple of lines of Python and someone else can immediately understand it. Um, we actually are at a time where I am more expensive as a person than the huge server that I'm using. So if I can write an app within a day instead of in a week, that's actually worth quite a lot of value. So these are all good reasons to use Python also for data analysis. Um, for this, we're going to use Pandas. For those of you that have not already uh, gotten the notebook, there are two ways of installing Pandas. The easiest way is to just use pip. Uh, do note that from the notebook, should you have a different Python version or you're using virtual environments, you can also just start your Python session, import the pip library, and just call a function that within your own py Python environment will install Pandas for you. So, the theory about uh, Pandas. Uh, basically, Pandas is just one object that we're continuously talking to. So instead of having a, like, a matrix, like a NumPy array within a NumPy array, uh, think of it more as an actual Excel sheet, but then in an object form. Uh, technically, Pandas is not about the animal, it's about a panel data structure, which according to the docs is defined as a two-dimensional size, mutable, potentially heterogeneous tabular data structure with labeled axes. Basically, an Excel sheet that has rows and columns. Every column has its own type, and the rows just basically say how many things are in the column. Um, the nice abstraction about this is that I can perform operations either per column or per row or both. So enough talk for now, let's just start doing the code. Uh, this is my simple notebook. Uh, and the first thing that I always do is make sure that I have everything installed that I need. Uh, I'm assuming everyone has installed the uh, Anaconda distribution, so everything should be already installed. Just to play it safe, can anyone, everyone just check if these two operations work? Just import NumPy, import Pandas. If these two things work, most of the rest of the training should go fine. Yes, okay, so everyone has sort of confirmed we can import these libraries. Yes, okay. Um, there, you can ignore this for now. This is basically just the uh, fact that I can show these images in my IPython notebook. We will get back to the visualization bit. Um, with NumPy, we can basically create an array of numbers. So what I've done here is I've just said, well, there's this thing called A, which is just a bunch of random numbers. There's this thing called B, which is just a bunch of random numbers. And then I have this list. Um, and this list is basically either foo or bar, also just random. And I can print these, and I can see that I've actually gotten three NumPy arrays. Sort of a confirmed nod, everyone has done this at this moment. At any point in the training, feel free to raise your hand if I'm going too fast, by the way. I'm assuming everyone at least did this. Um, we can sort of see these arrays that we've just created as separate columns, where every index of the array can be seen as a row in that one column. In that case, we would have the column name A, we would have the column name B, and we have the column name C. But we can both see this as maybe a dictionary and an Excel sheet. This is basically the thing that the pandas library does for you. Um, the only thing you have to do to create a pandas object is to have these arrays. Each array needs to be converted into a series object. And those series objects are then put into a dictionary. Um, could everyone please just make sure that they have done this? Everyone can see this, by the way, right? Everyone can... What you can then do, if you have such an object, is you can then print it. Before going on, I would just like to make sure that we are actually making something different than a NumPy array. So if I print um, the series object, which is in the dictionary, 
Notice that I have some sort of row numbering occurring and some values. I also seem to have a D type. It's telling me this is a floating number. If I look back up at the original array, it didn't give me this information. So I am actually getting back a different object. The idea is that what pandas will do is it will index your uh, NumPy array or array or what have you. And it will use that index to perform optimized uh, grouping uh, whenever you're doing things with data. I think that's exactly what I've written down here. A thing to keep in mind, pandas will always keep track of the type in the series. This means that if you have a series of strings, it will do different things to it than if you have a series of floats or numbers. This, be, this is quite normal if you think about, uh, if you want to summarize data, you cannot do a mean of a list of strings, for example, and pandas keep track of this. Um, so you can see that here, if I try to uh, make a new series object and it has a string, of, uh, a string of a float and a number, the D type will be an object because pandas is not really able to do anything with it. The only thing then left to do if you want to make a data frame is you say, well, we take that dictionary and we put that into uh, the constructor. With this, we're actually constructing uh, an instance of a data frame object. And again, this is the library, this is the data frame function, and it expects some sort of a dictionary. Yes? Okay. Now, the nice thing about PyPython Notebook, um, I can print this, uh, but I can also just choose to show it. Note now that I have an actual HTML table, which views quite nicely. And if I just print it, it will actually show me the standard output that you would get from a Python shell. Uh, IPython Notebook has some very nice little magical features that communicate very well with Pandas. Um, it might be good to know that Pandas is actually uh, one of the most used Python packages in the world, uh, simply because it removes the need for Excel. I will come back to this uh, later, but uh, do note that there's a couple of magic things that happen between Pandas and the IPython Notebook sometimes. But great, we've created our first uh, data frame object. So let's go and ask it some simple queries. Um, just a recap, we started out with just a couple of arrays. Each array is represented as its own column and each index represents a row. I have paid attention that these three uh, arrays are of equal length. That way, I, if I put it in a dictionary and then put that into a constructor for a data frame object, it gives me no errors. If the row numbers weren't the same, it would have given me an error. So it's an Excel sheet, right? So how about we just select one column? And we can do that by just uh, do using the object notation because this data frame is an object. And within the object, we have this object called A. This A is a series object. Now this data frame also behaves a bit like a dictionary. So what I've done now is I've asked a column from the data frame object style. What I can also do is I can ask uh, a column from a data frame dictionary style and it returns to me the same thing. Yes? Um, it is my personal preference to use the object style. Uh, the only reason for this is because it's less characters, uh, but use whatever you feel fit. The only thing I will recommend you do is that you keep your notation consistent through your entire document. This is also very nice if you're uh, communicating with different clients or different people use your uh, IPython notebook. Uh, this column does still behave like a NumPy array. So if I want to add uh, 10 to this column, uh, I can just say plus 10. What you are probably already sort of realizing is that usually when you have Excel and you have to write your own function, you will have to say, well, take that column and plus that, some function of that column. Um, I can do that with Panas as well. Uh, I could even multiply this by two and it wouldn't complain whatsoever. I can also just add a different column. And because this is a small number, you hardly see the difference. No, you would. Uh, the moment that it will give me an error is when I try to add a vector that is text. Because text addition with 
number addition doesn't really match up. Just like in normal Python, you'd get an error. What I could even do if I really want to, it's, suppose I want to define a new column, such a syntax would immediately work. So it's very Excel-like, but the positive characteristics are, I see a step-by-step -step Python notebook of everything that's been done, and if I ever get a new CSV file from the server, each of these steps get repeated without any human contact. So there's very little margin for error. Margin, it's very little possibility for error, I should say. Uh, what we can also do is we can uh, convert this list to a Boolean list. So if we, yes? Ah. This works to try it with this? This does, but this didn't. Because I can see it exists now, so I am accessing the same thing. But how about if I just say this then? Now look at it. The number has changed. Like this? Uh, let's do it like this. Yes? So let's check if it exists. Huh, you're right. Okay. Uh, thanks. This is new to me. <laughs> so I've learned something from this. Um, and if I do this, it should work, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will delete this comment. Simply to keep it uh, in line with the rest of the talk, we should use the dictionary style. Good comment, thanks. Um, still, what we can do is we can create a Boolean list. And uh, this Boolean list is kind of useful. What you can do is you can pass such a Boolean list to, uh, back to the original data frame. And notice that this Boolean list can, in some regard, be seen as a dictionary that maps a row number to a Boolean value. Basically, what we can then say is, hey, data frame, um, remember those rows we had? Well, this row should, is false, so don't list it. This row is false, so don't list it. Ah, this one is true, so keep that in mind. So for those of you who are familiar with Excel, uh, I should say uh, SQL, you have the select statement, select star from, and then the where. Basically, this is the PANAS equivalent of it. You create such a Boolean list, and for every uh, value where it says true, um, you can get a return value from it. So everyone try this out real quick. These values are random, so don't worry if the exact order of true and false isn't the same in your computer as it is in mine, but what you should be able to confirm is that um, this number, like this number is below zero, so this would be true. This number is below zero. Yes. These things should be equivalent. Yes. So if I then take this true-false list and give that back to the uh, data frame, it will actually do a subselect for me. Yes? Sure. Mm, yes? So you have these NumPy arrays, right? Uh, what I then did, I put everything in a dictionary. And once everything was in that dictionary, I then basically said pandas.dataframe and gave it the dictionary. Could you confirm if this works? Real quick. This, this works for you, like such?
Yes? Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, this is how I defined D beforehand. And again, uh, these A, B, and C uh, objects, they are arrays that I've instantiated. Is it okay if I go on now, or is this not being copied? Yes? Good. Okay. Um, so we had this Boolean list, and we gave it to the data frame. Uh, everyone can probably confirm that you get a shorter data frame back, right? The nice thing about this syntax is um, I can put any sort of Boolean list thing here, which can also be a combination of multiple Boolean lists. Uh, the data frame will only eventually say, well, if it's a, mo it's a list plus a list plus a list, it's going to get combined into a single list with and statements. So that means that you can make uh, arbitrarily complex uh, filters based on any sort of column, based on any sort of row, completely flexible in it. So you can all confirm by doing this? Yes? The export that means that uh, pandas overall all the built-in uh, very, very well to make it do something else. No, no, no. Technically, um, so this is a series object. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, the series object, as we saw before, behaves kind of like a numpy array. So when it sees this operation, this gets turned into a new series object. So basically, it says true, false, true, false, true, false. For every row number, there's a true and a false. And this is such a row, such a series object. This is such a series object. And basically, what I'm saying here is, well, those two series objects and them. This gives me a new series object. So what I can, I can actually show you this. It's, it's pretty much this, so this is a true-false list. This is a different true-false list. But if I combine them together like this, it's still one true-false list. And this one true-false list, well, that is eventually going to get passed in here. So as far as the data frame is concerned, it will only see one true-false list. And we'll base a subselection on that. Uh, what comes out of this, uh, that might be good to say, is a new pandas data frame. So I've not changed the original data frame object. The only thing that happened was I got a new data frame object out of it. Uh, what you can do afterwards, um, once you have such a thing, because it's a normal data frame as we saw before, uh, you can get a new column back from this one data frame. So this was our original data frame object. Now I'm just saying, well, just give me back the G column, for example. Works just like this. So we can see that most of the SQL-like things that we're doing right now can also be done in Pandas. Um, a nice aspect of this, um, the data frame is actually kept in memory, technically, because everything that Python runs uh, as an object is also kept in memory. This whole data frame object will also be in memory. That means that it's blazingly fast for doing these queries. Um, tomorrow, my colleague Giovanni will give a talk on how you can actually use Pandas as a database as well. If your interest is only to retrieve data based on some complex queries, um, you can and maybe should use Pandas for it. Okay, so these, these are basically the SQL type queries that we can do on it. So the from where statements we've done. 
Um, Pandas also shines in more custom um, methods. So what one could do is just like in the bash command, you can ask for the head of a document to get the first five lines. You can do the same thing with pandas to get the first five rows of your data frame. Everyone can confirm this. And there's a variable here, so if you want to see the only the first row, that's possible as well. Uh, same thing goes for the tail. If you quickly want to go ahead and check uh, what sort of uh, CSV you've just loaded in, this can be a very useful tool. Other things you might want to know include maybe the shape. Maybe you want to describe the entire data set. You can do that as well. What I've shown you guys here is the minimum, the maximum, all the quadrants, and the standard deviation and count of what I have in my data frame. And the extra nice thing is, if I have a data frame, then I can also pass it along a, um, like, a, an apply function. So I have my original data frame. Uh, I am saying that I want to get the mean um, per column. But I can do the same thing also uh, for the rows. A uh, quick thing about time series, so this will be going a little bit faster. Don't try to type along with this, it's just to show features. Um, uh, the person who made this library is called Wes McKinney, and Wes McKinney was working at, in New York at the time for a couple of financial institutions. So when he first made this, it was actually uh, made in mind for time series analysis. Uh, what I have here, and you can find this uh, data set on my blog, is just some financial information. This is the stock open, high, and closing uh, values, I think for Apple or something like that. Uh, I can show the first two um, uh, rows, and I note that uh, it has an index of numbers here, but it also has a date. Um, Pandas is relatively flexible in what it can accept as an index. So instead of giving it an index of just a number, like a row number you would expect from a SQL database, you can also just give it a date, and if you do that, it can do very intelligent things. So when loading in data, um, you have to be mindful because the data can have headers. If I give it an index column and tell it to parse dates, suddenly you will notice that the date has become the index. No longer the simple number, just the date will now be the index. Um, and if I just select one column, you will see that all of these numbers are indexed on the date. Which also means that if I want to aggregate, uh, I can quickly do that based on the date instead of anything else. So, uh, again, don't even try to type along. This is a little bit too fast, I'm sure. I get the, the data frame that I've just opened. I check the open price, and I choose to resample the entire data frame per week. And per week, I want to see the mean and the variance. And instantly, without any effort whatsoever, I get this which is a nice data frame that basically tells me the mean of every closing time per week. Uh, imagine doing this in Excel, right? Um, a, sm a small thing, by the way. Um, at the end, you see uh, a none. Basically, what it means is uh, I'm also calculating the variance per week. In this one week, we only had one data point, and a variance of only one data point doesn't exist. Um, I do think Pandas handles this quite nicely as well. The nice thing also is I basically said, well, I want to have the mean and the variance. Um, I can also resample per month. And what I can even do is basically give it my own function. If I write any function that can take a data frame in, it will apply it. So if I take the original data frame and also ask it to sample per month and to show the size of data that we have per month, it will do it without any problems whatsoever. Um, so time series support really, really is fast in this library. Uh, definitely check it out, especially if you're into financial data or any time series whatsoever. Um, these dates have been done by date. Uh, you can also make timestamps that are based on milliseconds. So if, even if you're interested in, uh, say, sensor data, this can be imme like, immensely powerful for you to use. Um, this does bring me to uh, a certain subject that we see a lot when applying data science, is I'm resampling, so I'm regrouping my data. And then I'm applying some sort of function on it, and then I'm bringing that all together. In the data science field, this is sort of known as the 
split apply combine uh, operation. So on the complete left, we see uh, our original data frame. Uh, we can see that we can split up based on some column. So maybe this is gender, maybe this is age group, maybe this is geolocation, whatever. Um, usually we're interested in doing some sort of function per group. So let's say per gender, we want to know the average age, for example. Um, and when we have calculated that per group, we want to make a new table that's putting everything back together. So that's where the apply, uh, split, apply, combine comes from. This is a thing that is from the R sort of world originally, um, and it's been incorporated into the Pumas library as well. So we have that image here as well. Um, if uh, we all went to my database, uh, my, my blog, right? There's this one uh, CSV file called chickweight. It's about chickens. Uh, the goal for this uh, data set is that there's a farmer and he has lots of chickens and he gives different groups of chickens different diets. And what he wants to find out is he wants to find out which diet is the best to get the chickens as fat as possible. It's a basic example, but it's well suited for what we want to do uh, because it immediately smells like a split, apply, combine type of operation. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm loading it in from my blog directly. So this read CSV file uh, that Pandas offers to you can either open a file locally. In that case, you just have to supply the entire path and the file as a string. It can also open any resource on the web. So if, if you can point it to a CSV that's on the web somewhere, it will make a URL request and get the data that way. What you should also uh, do is keep in mind that it has an index column which is called row now. So I suppose for you, it should look something like this. Come again? Uh, probably. <laughs> Uh, in practice, though, um, using relative paths is a bit dangerous uh, if you're working with, so in general, uh, what we like to do is we like to hire a server on Amazon and put like a huge machine and uh, do Python notebook through uh, some VPN connection. Uh, in that case, it would be nice if everyone from the same group is using the same file. So in pra if you do it now, perfect. In pra practice, eh, it's a little bit dangerous. Anyway, uh, given that we have this um, new chick uh, data frame loaded, we're just going to apply the same things we saw before. So this chicken uh, data frame, we can apply the head function on to see what the data frame actually looks like. So let's maybe just check the first 10 rows. And I can see that I have a column with a chicken ID in it. I have a column with a diet ID in it, some sort of measurement of time, and some sort of measurement for weight. Um, so, okay, this is probably a data frame that we can use. Let's just quickly go and check if the till has different information. Ah, yeah, looks like I can see that there's different chicks, different diets. Okay, good. So, the first step was we have to split everything, which basically means we're going to group data frames by a certain measure. Uh, well, in this case, it seems reasonable that we're going to split the data frame up by diet. This is a farmer. We want every chicken to get us fat as quickly as possible. Uh, so let's use the diet, because uh, then we can calculate maybe the weight per diet. Uh, what happens in Pandas is that you have this group by object. Uh, a group by object is nothing but a collection of tuples and data frames. Here I'm saying the chick data frame, uh, group uh, this data frame by the diet column. This group uh, item is something you can iterate over. So, if everyone is here, if you have this, try this out. And try to explain to, for yourself what you're looking at. Yes? Uh, if you group by the like a couple of couples, yes. the frame, then it will not be double, right? I mean, no, no, no. So, so, what you're looking at here, uh, uh, the chicken, so, this basically has four values, and there are four diets. What you're looking at here is the first value and all the data frames that correspond to 
to having a diet with that fat. Yeah, in practical terms, in terms of memory usage. Ah, yes. Do you have a double memory or a double memory? I think you can. I can't imagine that it would just double. I think you use pointers. That's a little bit next point. Um, you can check the blog of the creator. The, the most anything you see here is either based on NumPy or Cycling in the game. And the guy who made this is really, really <laughs> specific about performance. Uh, so I can't imagine you would double your memory. He probably implemented it with some intelligence. I wouldn't know for sure though, so I would check out the docs. But. Um. In terms of usage, though, for now, uh, we can see, ah, so this is the first diet, and we can see an entire data frame. Here's the second diet, third diet, and the fourth diet. Yes? Is each string, each string is a data frame? A string? Ah, so now what I'm doing, so this is a grouped object, if you will. Um, and from the looks of it, it is a tuple where the first index, it might not actually be a tuple to be honest, this is sort of the print representation. The second object is another frame value. So yeah, so uh, value of the column, data frame. Value of the column, data frame. Yes. Um, the cool thing about this is, just like before, I could define any function that I can apply per group, I can do that here as well. And this is sort of the power of uh, these data frames. So what you can see now is if I take this grouped object and I try to describe it, uh, for every uh, other column that we had, I get this information for free. And, I, and again, and I mean this with all seriousness, try to do this in Excel. You can also define your own function, but let's first, uh, maybe I'm going too fast. So everyone has confirmed you can print the grouped object, you can look and describe the group object. And once you're there, you can define your own function, something maybe like this. I could then take this grouped object and apply any arbitrary function I define on that object. It's kind of the, like the functional programming paradigm is sort of coming back here. And also if you're used to maybe Hadoop, maybe the MapReduce uh, programming style, this is, this is very similar. Um, so when I saw this the first time, uh, basically this was my reaction. Because uh, just to take a couple of steps back, uh, this any function and any group you can specify. So what this also means is I can group by multiple columns at the same time. If I want to know per diet, per time unit, what the weight was and apply a mean on it, sure, it, it looks like a bit of a chain, but if I look at the API, I know I can quite clearly read what it's doing. It is a chicken data frame, it's a CSV file. It's grouping it by these two columns. From it, I take the weight and I'm applying a function towards it. Uh, in one line of code, I've done a lot of steps and it's very, very readable. Especially if you use the Python programming already. So the, the, one, the reason why I'm focusing in on this, um, this means that your documentation has been taken care of for free. Simply, if you just take the, the Pythonic approach here, all the data science that you're doing with your colleagues is documented. Because this IPython notebook can be saved on a server, and it can be used for reference whenever, even as CSV files get updated. So suddenly, we have a bit of automation in this. Oh, what do you want, Giovanni? <laughs> yes? This? Okay. Could you? Yeah, maybe. If... Yeah. I think technically, so I defined a function before, which is called show size. Technically, this should work as well.
Um, what this, yeah, so of course it's like a very ridiculous example, but you can imagine situations where in your own company there's a very specific thing that needs to get done to a certain data frame, and the only thing you have to do now is make your own defined function. Do you guys remember how, how hard it was to make macros in Excel? Like, that's free here. For the last, I'm sort of raving on about it. Um, is everyone sort of done with this? Because this is sort of the easy steps for pandas. I think, hopefully, I've given you a good image of what pandas initially is trying to do and what it sort of does. Um, we, are not ha we are not completely done with the entire sort of data analytics thing we want to do, though. Um, because very, very technically, uh, we haven't visualized anything. I cannot go to my chief or my boss and say, hey, look, I've got a data frame, everything's summarized. We need to do a little bit more. And that's sort of where visualization comes in. Now, before, I've told you all the good parts about Python, like reasons why you would want to use it. Uh, there is a small reason why you might not want to use it. Uh, data science in general is a young thing, and data science in Python is especially young. There's a programming language called R that originated, I think, 10 to 15 years ago. And R is a programming language that was founded only to do statistical analysis with it. So it's no surprise that a very domain-specific thing, namely visualization of data, uh, came from that field of programming. Uh, up till today, I have not found a package that is so well-suited for uh, visualization of data as ggplot. I have just spoken to the guys from Continuum to Analytics, and they're working on this project called Bokeh. It's very, very promising, and I would love to see where it goes. It's not up to par of ggplot yet, um, which is still why I feel this is a good thing to learn. Uh, and I hope to convince you just by looking at the API. So this is the code you need to make a line chart for matplotlib. Uh, this is seriously how I feel about it. If I just want to make a line chart, I should not have to write 50 plus <laughs> uh, lines of code. Um, and even the creator of Pandas agrees. Uh, he has spoken about this. So what he says here in a statement on his blog is that he definitely agrees that ggplot2 is awesome. And he's actually hoping that someone out there will make a ggplot for Python. So we can wait for people to make this. Um, it is, however, very easy to just take your IPython notebook and only use R to make these visualizations. It's one line of code. Before we actually go and do that, let me just first show you why the ggplot2 API is so powerful. Uh, just in your own head, try to think what this bit of code should do. So what I'm saying is, hey, I have this um, object P, it's a ggplot object, and on this ggplot object, I'm going to add something called a geom point. It takes in a data thing, it's called check weight, I don't know what it does yet. Oh, and it takes another thing, but it says that the x is equal to time and the y is equal to weight. Um, so what should this thing do in your own head? Probably just make a point chart, right? And, and again, I don't want to be raving, but it's this <laughs> versus this. Um, and this is only the start, so not only can I make the basic charts very easily, it's also very flexible. Uh, the next step would be to say, well, what would this do? It's the exact same code as before, but the only thing that's different is I've said size is equal to five. Oh, bigger points. Oh, okay, so th this, this, this thing is also kind of poetic in that you can read what it does and it's only one line of code. So, that, okay, this is kind of Pythonic even, even though it comes from a different uh, language. This is nice. Uh, what might this do? Determined by the weight, yes. So as the weight is higher and higher, the point will be thicker and thicker. And note that it doesn't have to be uh, something on the y-axis. It can also be a different column from the data frame. Another one. What will this do? We should color something, right? So remember in the, in the column we had IDs for chickens? Basically the only thing that this does is it gives a different color for every chicken and it draws a separate line for every chicken. Uh, this is free, so again, imagine doing this in matplotlib or Excel for that matter. Um, and this is a very flexible API, so these are just point graphs. Uh, what I can also just do is say I want to have a histogram, but instead of having it all one color, I want the fill to be determined by the diet, so I have a different color. 
for free, stack bar chart. Um, what I can also even do if I really want to, and this is where it starts to get kind of ridiculous, um, the plotting library ggplot is lazy. That means that if I keep on saying, uh, I have my original uh, plotting object and I append something to it, but it gets a variable, it will only really output the graph if uh, I say print this variable p, which means that I can append as many aspects to it as I want. So what I'm saying here is, well, I want to make a histogram, but after it, put it in a grid. And with two lines of code, it will give me this. So per diet, I now have a distribution for the weight. And again, I cannot imagine doing this with two lines of code in Matplotlib. Um, we have another example. Uh, in this case, I have a bunch of points that I'm drawing, and I'm doing something called GM smooth. GM smooth is also part of the plotting package, and what it does, it just tries to smooth a pa the pattern that's in the data, and visualize it as well. Uh, at the end, what I do is I give the, um, the graph a title, and it'll look like this. This is three lines of code. Um, so now we get to the part on how we can pipe um, pandas to R. Uh, the R language also has a notion of a data frame object, so everything you've seen here in the code is exactly how it's written in R. The only thing that we need to do is where it says data equals economics, that's where we need to have a data frame. Uh, but there is a very good functionality for piping a Python data frame to R. So uh, what you will need is uh, a module called rpy2. This is the module that allows for the communication between you two. Uh, when R is installed in IPython, you will need to say, hey, be mindful, also load R in. And you will then need to just push the data frame and run R code within a block. One other thing you kind of need to do as well, and this is why you need to download RStudio. And we'll have to check the time, because uh, at this point we're hopefully going to experiment a bit more and I'm going to walk around answering questions. Um, if you've downloaded RStudio, make sure you've uh, installed ggplot2. That's the plotting library. And once you've done that, we can go through all of these steps. Um, so yeah, I'll leave this open for now. Do we... We have about 15 more minutes, so what I can do is either wait and have everyone try and set things up, or I can just show you what I've got, and you can ask me all sorts of questions afterwards. Is, uh, the second one? Okay, good. Perfect. Um, so again, remember when I made the notion that in the beginning of my IPython notebook, there was this thing called load external R2Py? This basically means that I've loaded in the thing that can communicate between uh, R and Python. Uh, here I have previously installed R2Py uh, via pip. This is kind of a nice trick, by the way. If you're using IPython notebook and you don't know which Anaconda distribution you're using, you can just use this one function and it can install uh, any package within the virtual environment you're actually using at the moment. Uh, but yeah, alas, that. Uh, once I have this, the only thing I technically need to do is when I have a data frame, I use one block to say, well, push this data frame to R. And then in another block, everything that's listed here is run in R. Because I'm saying, use this magic, everything that's listed in here is now an R function. Uh, I'm telling it, well, use a width of about 1,200 pixels and take this chicken uh, weight uh, data frame in. I'm going to have to apply a different screen size just to show it. Uh, but basically, um, I have just used a Python object, piped it to R, and made this graph, again, with just two lines of code. I, I will agree, there's a bit of overhead uh, that you have to actually do these two steps, but it's nowhere near the overhead you need when using Matplotlib. So just like before, I'm increasing the size, and just like before, I can do things with the weight, and just like before, um, I can turn this diet into a factor and also have every diet have its own color while uh, the weight is uh, the thing that's making the dots bigger and smaller. We've seen this chart before as well. Uh, what's also kind of nice to note is uh, because of the laziness of the ggplot module, I can have points and lines just blended in into one graph. And I have histograms as well.
Yes. Or for ggplot? Yes, of course. Good question. Um, ggplot has the best documentation I've ever seen in my entire life. So just go to ggplot2.org. These are the docs. Oh, you mean that you can say help file and then, uh, well, let's try it out. Okay, I can imagine it wouldn't have that support. Uh, fear not, though, uh, because technically um, the docs for ggplot are so ridiculously good. Uh, let's say I just want to make the points, so I just go for point graph. Mm. Yep. Um, basically, it's everything you can possibly do with it plus every single chart as an example as well. So you can just cut and paste this code into um, Python and it will work. So if I do this, this should work out of the box. Hmm? Right. Don't. Okay, I will have to get back on this. Um, I think what I've not done is I need to do this, and then I need to do this. And now it still doesn't know that I have check weight. Huh, that's odd. And if I do this, there we go. So all the examples uh, that you see on this website will work out of the box in R. And because they work out of the box in R, they will also work out of the box inside of IPython notebook. Uh, I will agree that there is a bit, the one thing that's kind of annoying at this stage is that I actually have to take that data frame from Python and push it to R. I would, like, that's a very annoying aspect of it. The only reason is this is still so much faster than using Matplotlib. It's purely because I find this very powerful. Uh, there is a project from Wyatt. Uh, what they're actually trying to do is to write a layer of abstraction on Matplotlib. So you can actually download a module called ggplot for Python. Uh, it's actually a kind of a nice project. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the plots are actually very similar and the way you would call it is also very similar. Uh, it's just that the docs are still incomplete. Uh, it's 0 0.5 version at the moment as well. Uh, so it's not near something I would use in practice. Uh, having said that though, um, Typically what one would do if you're doing this data science is you would keep all the aggregations still in Python uh, such that you can then uh, push that aggregated data frame into R. And this is where things actually do get quite interesting because what you're looking at now is the points are basically the data points from the chickens. The only thing that I've done before is I've said, well, group the diet and the time by weight and calculate the mean. That basically means that for every weight and for every time that I have here, I have a point. And that makes it very easy to just make this one graph. And when you're looking at this graph, it instantly becomes quite apparent that if you want to make your chickens as fat as possible, you just use diagonal. So the main gist that I'm trying to say here is don't underestimate how powerful visualizations are in the daily graph. Uh, most of the stuff you do, like 90% of the work, will be still in data preparation and machine learning and all of those fun things. Um, but the latter 10% is actually the most important because that will actually get you the budget and that will actually convince people are pictures like this. And because that is sort of the sales step and it's so very important to whatever you do, and uh, I don't want to make any compromises. I want to have the best quality library ever is. And it's my opinion that she's fun. Uh, also, it doesn't really hurt to learn a little bit of R. A lot of, a lot of clients tend to use it. Um, then sort of as a final exercise, and then uh, I'm open to any questions and we can go and hack about a bit. Uh, there's a CSV file uh, that I don't know what it exactly does. So this, these are sort of the steps that one would take to analyze it. Uh, I would load it up and I would take it into Pandas. I would push the data frame to R uh, and I would see what the data frame actually is. Well, uh, let's just check what this does. So I seem to have a, uh, a data set. There's something of an X axis, there's something of an R axis, and there's something of a Y axis. Hmm. Let's see what is in it. Ah, 
So uh, one of the axes is numeric, the other one is also numeric, and the other one seems to be characterized. <laughs> Interesting. Let's see if we can plot this. So what I'm now doing is I'm making a histogram. Uh, for every single um, factor that I have in this column, I choose a different color. And I can see that hmm, this seems to be sort of a distinct distribution already on the x values. And I can do a similar thing on the y. This is sort of interesting. So at this stage, I kind of have no idea what this data frame is, but I can immediately see that there's a pattern. So also, not just at the end phase of doing data analysis, but also at the beginning phase, it's actually quite, quite useful to be able to have a fast exploratory tool. Um, it becomes kind of more apparent when I split it up. So this is definitely sort of a strange data set. That is, unless you plot the x and y axis. And then a different message and pattern becomes quite apparent. Um, so this, this was the, basically everything I wanted to just go ahead and talk to you about. Uh, we still have well over 15 minutes uh, from the gist of it. So what I would like to propose is that first, if there are any questions, we can do those first. And if not that, then everyone can just go ahead. And if people want to take a break, that's fine as well. But that you can then use me for any random questions you might have. Yes? Okay. Thank you. First question for me, I guess. Did you guys learn something new from this? Because for the people who, for, who, for who this was new, I definitely hope you kind of got the idea of what pandas is and why it's cool and why plotting is important and how you can combine the two things. So as long as you guys feel comfortable that you've actually learned something today, then that's, uh, that was my main concern. But, okay, cool. Uh, any questions? I have a silly one. I was trying to follow the last bit. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> good question. Uh, oh, I actually have some slides. How about that? Um, there is a library, but you still have to install it. Uh, if you have the R Studio, it's, it's very, very easy. It's just a click. If you don't have the R Studio, there's kind of a, a pip-like uh, thing. It's called Seiran, uh, but the R Studio thing is the easiest thing. Uh, one thing that's kind of nice about R, like I don't know if people have used it, um, it is maintained by the academic community. So every package that you download is basically its own machine learning library. And there's a guy with six PhDs who is actually maintaining it, and he's actually the expert on the field. So that, that is a nice aspect of R. Uh, the only downside of it is, is that it's a fairly academic language because of this as well. And therefore, it is mostly used only for statistics and that sort of thing. So I will never think about building a server in R. There are people that are doing it, but I think they're insane. Um, yeah, having said that, by the way, um, if you're interested in visualization, there are some other things you might want to look at. Uh, for machine learning, there are these things called scikit-learn and PyBrain and PyMC, and you've probably heard of those, but those are very good packages. I recommend you look at them. They play nice with pandas as well. For visualization, if you're not really into ggplot, I guess you can use matplotlib. Uh, I just checked out the guy who made Bokeh. It, it looks interesting. It's not there yet, but it's worth a look, definitely. Um, there's a thing called D3, which you might have heard of, which is an SVG library for visualizations. Uh, Vincent is a layer of abstraction for this. Uh, so you can use D3 type visualizations within your IPython notebook. It's pretty good. Um, it's just that your browser crashes if you have more than 1,000 SVG points, so only for small data. Uh, there's a thing called iGraph, which is good for visualization of uh, graph type uh, structures. And D3 in general is something you might want to look at if you're doing any visualizations for the front end, where you have Python as a back end. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, I just checked with the O'Reilly guy. Uh, the leftmost book is actually the best one, and has been sold out. Uh, if you really are keen on learning this, the guy who made Pandas actually wrote the book, and I can highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's an easy read. Within a month, you'll have read it, and you can do everything. If you're more interested in learning Python in general, the Mining the Social Web might be good. In that book, what you will do is you will download data from Facebook and from LinkedIn and Twitter and try to do something intelligently with it. It's more for if you're uh, new to Python. Uh, the Machine Learning for Hackers is also highly recommendable. That's more for the scikit-learn, so people who really want to go into the machine learning. But that's something new that they want to do. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, the, the, now I'm definitely done and through all my slides. Any questions? No, <laughs> no, no. Uh, um, the Vincent Library is pretty cool, but so here's the, bit of, here's the problem with the Vincent Library, at least in my opinion. Uh, so this is my blog, and um, for those of you that are Dutch, uh, do you know what Funda is? 
Okay, so Funda is a website where you can basically check every, all the house prices that are on sale. You can check the prices, you can check how much uh, room there is in the house, and etc. Uh, it's also very easy to parse. So what you can just do is you can download all the data, and you can then visualize it on a map and give it a nice little color code to basically say, well, this is a house I might be willing to buy, and this might not be. Um, for me, it was just sort of a proof of concept, so you can actually show that I probably won't be living in the city center. But the main problem with the Vincent Library is I'm drawing quite a lot of points here. And these points are, in the end, SVG uh, graphics. An SVG object is an, is an object that actually lives in the DOM inside of your client. Uh, it's pretty okay if I only have uh, below 1,000 or so of these SVG points. But as soon as I hit 2,000, uh, this browser is going to become very, very laggy, simply because it has to render so many things. Uh, and that's the problem with the Vincent library. If you, if you end up um, doing very, very large graphs, like a scatter plot with more than 2,000 points, uh, your browser just might crash. So the, 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 that's my opinion. I still, I still think it's a nice library. Uh, I just wouldn't use it in production for my personal uses. I still prefer ggplot. So um, yeah. Uh, the ggplot, you mean, or? Yes. So, uh, just by looking at R, uh, there, there is a bit of tweaking, there is a bit of hacking. Um, but R can export, let's just do two graphs. Uh, if I just check out what R has as a functionality, uh, I can copy this graph to the clipboard, I can uh, save it as a PNG image, or I can even save it as a PDF, which also is basically an SVG image. So, um, everything I do here, basically, uh, runs a line of R code in the back, and that R code can also be run in the IPython notebook if you wanted to. So you could automatically save all of these charts, put it somewhere so that the server might be able to render it. Um, but it's, that aspect is basically the same as matplotlib. The idea would then be generate a new graph, uh, update an image somewhere, send that to the client. Does this answer your question? Uh, yeah, you, if, if you really wanted to, you could, yeah, but it's the same story, I suppose. Uh, the idea would be that you would have some sort of a update loop, so once every minute or so make these new plots, uh, and then the plots would be updated somewhere, and then that would be the plot that would get retrieved, and if you have something with web sockets or something intelligent, also send something asynchronously to the client, you can update it automatically like that, but definitely, at least to my knowledge. Then, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, be free. And of course, if, if, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and of course, if there are questions, I'll be right here. <laughs>